she talking to now? What is she up to next? Where in the world will she be? Talk to Welcome SV. to another exciting episode of Talk to SV. March is Women's History Month. Talk to SV, brought to you by Who is she talking to now? What is she up to next? Where in the world will she be? Talk to SV. You just might be inspired. I know you're gonna have fun. Talk to SV covers entertainment and lifestyle, news, upcoming movies, and current events. I was blessed with the opportunity to sit in San Francisco with human rights activist Dolores Huerta and filmmaker Peter Bratt. We discussed the documentary that chronicles her life, much of it alongside the late Cesar Chavez. Aptly titled Dolores, this film is, as she a blueprint for all to follow. Full of passion, commitment, purpose, and action, a veritable manuscript for today's climate of revolutionary change. The conversation began with Peter Bratt about his opus of a living legend. If you're attempting to make a feature documentary or a feature film, you have to be hella organized. <laughs> you know, you're, you're working on a narrative, you're working with a crew of about 300 people, and then, you know, with the feature doc, you know, your, your crew got as much as 45 people, and you have to be very strategic because, you know, you have a limited amount of funds, and so you have to be uh, efficient in how you structure your time and how you schedule your crew. And then uh, you also have to be efficient in chasing down Dolores Huerta, who's <laughs> on the move seven days a week. <laughs> So you have to be, uh, you really have to have, have uh, uh, a firm strategy in place to move forward. Um, but, you know, it took, a, it took about a nine months to do the research, you know, before even, you know, moving into the production phase. Just uh, for about nine months, I just read volumes really? of, of everything I could find on her. And there wasn't that much, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. But, you know, reading about the history of the UFW and most of it centered around Cesar mm -hmm. and, and and a lot of the information uh, doesn't even mention her as a co-founder. Mm -hmm. She was there from, from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wow, why is all this information missing from the historical record? And then come to find, once we started the uh, archival research, you know, we were crisscrossing the country, um, to find, for somebody who wasn't a co-founder and who was left out of the, the historical record, there was all this incredible archival really? footage documenting her in the trenches you know, over who seven. was the possessor of it? Where, where did oh, you find there, there, there are indi pri individuals who own the material. There are university archives. There are public library archives. Mm -hmm. But they're housed, you know, across the country in, in dozens and dozens of, of, of vaults. You've been doing this work. It's as if you were born to do this work. But strangely, given the career you had amassed up until 2007, as it were, when Barack Obama had the title of being a community organizer, all of a sudden people just seem to think that, oh my God, a community organizer is the thing to do. You've been doing this your entire life. Did you take a pause at that point? Was it anything reflective about the world becoming aware of the invaluable nature of community organizing? Oh, I was delighted. I was delighted, especially when he was attacked by Sarah Palin and kind of, oh, well, he's just a community organizer. Right. But commu community, community organizers are, are what makes things happen. And of course, I was and always a community organizer. I mean, like many people, I wanted to do something. I was a Girl Scout for 10 years of my life, from the time I was eight to the time I was 18. I belonged to a lot of different social clubs because I did want to belong to something that did something. And when I met Fred Roth Sr., who really taught us the how you could organize to make meaningful change, not to just to give out Christmas baskets, you know, you know, but to go out there and really uh, make policy changes. And that's when I got totally, totally hooked, mm -hmm. totally addicted. Which sort of segues into a thought I was having, you know, did this movement call you or did you make the movement become what it was alongside Cesar Chavez? Well, I think it was a combination because Cesar and I came from the same school. Fred Ross is the one who recruited Cesar in a house meeting. He recruited me in a house meeting. 
and uh, you know we learned from from Fred how to do this basic uh, type of uh, what we call a how organizing in people's homes we call it a house meeting so you know the the venue is their home their 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 front yard or their living room that is the venue where you do where the magic takes place mm-hmm. you know where you're actually convincing people that they have power and they can do things and so uh, once I learned this and uh, and then you know like that we kind of we did that with the community service organization. We changed a whole bunch of laws in the state of California, and that was to get uh, uh, ballots in the Spanish language to uh, do door-to-door voter registration, which, by the way, in Texas, you can't do that. And uh, in Texas, they still have the voting laws that we had back in the, in the 50s and the 60s, okay? But in 1963, I lobbied that law through Sacramento. Uh, we got driver's licenses in people's native language, uh, ballots in people's uh, languages, and um, passed this big bill that we have in, in the movie that you didn't have to be a citizen to get public assistance. If you were a resident alien, you could get p- uh, public assistance. So these are all laws that we passed before the UFW and disability insurance for farm workers. We passed all of these laws, okay? Then with the union that we passed on employment insurance for farm workers, which Ronald Reagan vetoed three sessions in a row after it passed the legislature, and then we got the right to organize. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, so this is, and this all came from the people that did voter registration in the communities mm-hmm. and let the candidate and let the people that were running for the legislature know that they were doing this work and then put the pressure on them uh, to make sure that they voted. This is like Democracy mm-hmm. 101, mm-hmm. you know, Democracy 101. And, and getting out there, knocking on doors to get people out to vote. I think the timing of this movie is spiritual because of what we're going through right exactly. now. And what we need to be reminded of. Um, and what, what say you about just the calendar period that we're in and what it means to this film? Well, as an organizer, I think it's an organizing opportunity mm-hmm. because so many, and, and I say that not to be cynical, but uh, because I think that people are now really awakened, you know, especially the Latino community where we're getting one blow after the other, you know, we're Mexicans, we're rapists, we're criminals, we need a wall going after a, a judge because he was a, a Mexican-American, Judge Curiel, uh, who was, uh, you know, had the the Trump uh, lawsuit against Trump University on his desk, mm-hmm. and now with it, with DACA and and uh, you know, uh, pardoning Joe Arpaio, who was convicted mm-hmm. of racial, of racial profiling yeah. and abuse of, of Latinos and not to mention Charlottesville and yeah, Boston. So I mean, it, and so I think now people are, are paying attention, and so luckily the film is coming out at this time, and mm-hmm. you know, Peter as a as a prophet, he might say, uh, when he made this movie. Is uh, you know I think it's saying to people, look, if the farm workers could do this, ordinary people can do this. You who are a citizen and speak English and have a, a, an education, then you can also get involved and, and make changes. Hmm. I mean, I also th- I also think it's one of the things that's highlighted in the film is you know, the 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 Lord's and Cesar, They start off you know fighting for labor rights, mm-hmm. but but they came up uh, they came up against a wall of, of, of racism. And that animal has been in the room, but we've been ignoring it for so long. And you know, eight years ago, when when, uh, when Barack got elected to the president, everyone started saying we were post-racial. You know, that was the thing. Of, that, that was the thing of the past. Mm-hmm. And of course, in communities of color, we we know otherwise. But that, like as Dolores said, you know, that the hood has been taken off. It's mm-hmm. it's it's sitting there right now in plain daylight and everyone can see it and it's it's becoming a huge problem that's informing impacting uh, policy on from top to bottom, economic, social, mm-hmm. education. Um, and it needs to be addressed. We need to wrestle with mm-hmm. it. We need to uh, be honest about it. Mm-hmm. And 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 I and I hope the film can can jump start that conversation. For sure. Sí se puede. For Cesar, sí se puede wasn't just a slogan. When people in Arizona said, they told me, no, Dolores, no se puede. You can't do this in Arizona, uh, only in California. My response to them was, sí se puede. Sí se puede, sí se puede. Hers was the rallying cry that would later come to define the presidential campaign of candidate Barack Obama. Yes, we can. Have you heard President Obama say, Yes, we can. It came from Cesar Chavez. Si se puede. 
Dolores Huerta came up with the slogan, Si se puede, and we all attribute that uh, to uh, Cesar Chavez, even Barack Obama. Of course, when he gave her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he had to correct himself. <laughs> On a personal note, uh, Dolores was uh, very gracious uh, when I told her I had stolen her slogan, uh, Si se puede, yes we can. Uh, <laughs> Knowing her, uh, uh, I'm pleased that she let me off easy, because uh, Dolores does not play. What was it like growing up, knowing that Dolores and Cesar and others were out in front of you making a way for the life you now enjoy, you and your brother? Uh, well, as, as a, uh, I'm a, I was raised by a single mother, mm -hmm. indigenous mother from Latin America, mm -hmm. and she was, you know, she was part of the movement mm -hmm. when the when the boycott came to San Francisco, the, you know, the Bay Area and San Francisco, particularly in the Mission District, was a hotbed for for uh, for activism, and it was almost like a, a farm workers' headquarters. So we were inspired, we were affected. I saw Dolores on the front lines with Cesar, and you couldn't help. But, ha but have, take pride in, in finally in who you were. I mean, up to, up to that point, you kind of like hid in the shadows about who you were. And, you know, there was, you were fed all these, all this information about, you know, your inferior and your color and your people and your history. And all of a sudden, there, there was this burst of pride. So I was personally impacted by that. Mm. And then, um, and then growing up as an adult, you know, I heard Dolores say one time, you know, what are you going to do with your privilege? And, you know, I, I, had, I did have the privilege of, privilege of getting a university education. Um, and, and so to go fast forward and not to be, not to be, you know, doing a film on Dolores mm -hmm. and traveling around with Dolores and learning from her, um, you, you might say it's come full circle for me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hope that the film well, actually, I know the film has, I hope it could inspire and lift up the pride of, of, of countless Latinos and other people of color who see it, because right now uh, we're down. A lot of us are feeling very down. Across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Across the and board. the people will realize no matter how bad things are, I mean, we were up against Richard Nixon, the President of the United States, and Ronald Reagan, the Governor of California. And yet people were able to overcome that. And that's the one thing we want to remind people. And uh, we've been, I've been quoting uh, uh, the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, who says, they can cut all the flowers, but they can't hold back the spring. Mm. You know, we have to remember that, you know. And so we have to stay out there and sow those seeds of justice and keep, keep working. Mm. Because we know these times are going to pass. And I, I frankly believe when this is over, we're going to come out stronger. Because if we see all these young people that are protesting, those are white kids that are they're protesting, you know. And they're marching to support, uh, to support Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. to, you know, to support DACA, mm -hmm. you know, to support immigrant rights and LGBT rights and women's reproductive rights, you know. And so I think this is the hope. And uh, but the one, uh, again, the one caution I always have is, you got to march, you got to protest. But if you don't vote, it doesn't make any difference because the policies do not change. And you've got to get people that are going to represent us that are going to change those policies and make those policies work in our favor and not against us. Mm. And I hope you indulge me. Um, as a woman, how, how much attention did you pay to your femininity in a construct that maybe didn't celebrate women at the forefront? Mm. Right, uh, it, it, not enough attention, uh, and I think that comes out of the movie. I was always conscious, uh, you know, Cesar Chavez's wife, Helen, was a very strong woman, uh, but she preferred her, Helen's passion, like my passion is to be organizing, her passion was to be a homemaker. This, this is what she loved to do, and for her to be in the public eye was very painful for her. Um, and, and she did a lot of the work. She ran our credit union uh, in the farmworkers union and, and did an incredible job uh, in doing that. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was a very strong a symbol in many ways, but she didn't want to be a public symbol. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of women like Helen in the organization and uh, they did the work, but they were not um, 
you might say at the decision making level you know what i mean but they were like the worker bees mm -hmm. but not at the decision making level and i think that's uh, the one place where uh you know i kept kind of pushing and we've got to have more women on the board especially when you could see the chauvinism that was taking place that was being exhibited and it's interesting because when when you're right there on the on the line of fire everybody's pretty equal but then when you get back to the boardroom and then that's when things start changing and you see the little power plays and you see that women are not in uh, they're not in the equation of those power plays and uh and i feel very strongly you know i'm on the board of the feminist majority and i really and i made a speech once at a convention an now convention and i said if you're watching uh, on, your, on your television screen and, and you see a bunch of men and these are the people that are making the decisions for the world you know that that's there's something wrong with that picture because there aren't any women in that picture and i really really firmly believe that i think that we have to have and i say when i say the word women i mean feminists that are at the table when decisions are being made if not they are going to make the wrong decision and coretta scott king said if we don't have until women take power we will never have peace and i do believe that what is it that you know making a film and telling a story about a living legacy involves you know, so much it involves vision, but then you have to focus and narrow it down. You have to pare it down because there's so much to say. What was important for you to say about Dolores, and how much input did she have on what was said about her? Right. Uh, it's a it's a fine line. You know, you're first of all you're approaching a subject. You know, you have a, you come with a, this immense amount of respect and admiration. And like you said, she's an iconic figure, so she she's she belongs to the people. And so you don't want to do a puff piece mm -hmm. and just like you don't want to kind of homogenize her and turn her into this icon who's you know a perfect being. So for me, and I had a you know very honest and frank conversation with Dolores that I want I really want to show her in all her humanity. Mm -hmm. And that means all the complexities. If she has any regrets, I, I want to explore what those are. I want to hear from her children. I want to hear about the painful times and the. the I want. I want to see the transformation. Like she was at one time, she was uh, as a Catholic. You know, she was against. Absolutely. She was. She, yeah, she was against abortion. And then, how did that? How did that evolve? How did her? How did that change of mind to become pro-choice? How did that happen? Mm. You know, how did she deal with the with the struggle against chauvinism? So, so I was, you know, I told her I wanted to to paint a, a full picture, a human picture, because that's the best way an audience can relate. Mm -hmm. If you, if somebody's perfect, and it's all tribute, it's boring. Mm -hmm. um, but if but if you can if you can show the humanity and the spirit of that person, then, then people are going to get on board. You know, they're going to see themselves in there, and so mm -hmm. that. That was the challenge. Sure. You know, and if you look at films that have been done on our iconic figures, you know, they're lionized, and and that's all they are. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. then they become two-dimensional cardboard cutouts. Mm -hmm. You know, and that doesn't serve anybody. When we talk about evolution and transformation, what do you recognize by yourself today that was always there from the beginning? Well, uh, you know, we change as we, you know, as we grow up. I think my uh, my passion when I was a kid, you know, being a Girl Scout, and my passion today is to try to see how I can help people. I think that's been there throughout my life, you know, very, very consistent throughout my life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so I think that's my, my, my moving uh, factor, you might say, of everything that I do is, uh, you know, how can I... You know, whatever I, skills that I have, you know, whatever resources I have, how can I do that to make the world a better place? And, and I think that's kind of the, the mantra that I think that I grew up with. Did you ever wrestle with fear? Uh, always. I think you always have fear because, number one, for instance, uh, uh, when I decided to leave my job as a teacher uh, to go to Delano, uh, to organize uh, farm workers with no money and seven children going through the middle of a divorce. That was pretty scary. And making an, a, what everybody would consider to be an irrational decision, because if you put all of the, why should I and why should I not? And, you know, you can think of all of the reasons. I had my own home. You know, I had many, many friends in the community. I had all of my relatives there. 
and I'm leaving all of that and under fierce criticism from almost everybody. When I went to Delano, you know, with my seven kids, dragging my seven kids with me, leaving a couple of them behind, you know, well, I, well, I went until I could get settled and then I just, uh, you know, working there for just a short while and then the strike breaks out. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so it, there's a lot of fear there, but, uh, and the thing is about, and I think fear sometimes inhibits us and keeps us from doing what we need to do. And so we have to take risks and doing what I did was a big risk. And I think in terms of doing anything significant, we have to take those risks and we have to overcome those fears. We have to overcome those fears. The fear is always present in one way or the other. You know, worrying about your kids, worrying about whether you're doing the right thing or not. Worrying, worrying like in the strike, we're worried about whether you're putting people's lives at risk and knowing that you have that responsibility to make sure that people are safe on your picket line. You know, there's, there's always fear. It, it lives with us, fear lives with us. Mm -hmm. But we have to learn how to deal with it and not to let it overcome us. Mm -hmm. Because once we do that, then we are paralyzed, we can't do anything. Brought to you by Who is she talking to now? What is she up to next? Where in the world will she be? Talk to let's be. You just might be inspired. I know you're gonna have fun. Just switching gears a little bit, I, um, I'm i sure you hear this all the time, thank you, but I'm curious to know who has said thank you and maybe have been a part of some of the more meaningful thank yous that you've received over the years? Oh, I get so many thank yous. Mm -hmm. I get them in the mail every day. I get them from people on the street, people that see me or they see me on television or somebody whose parents or grandparents were with the movement. And I get all of these thank yous. And, I, and sometimes I don't feel like I really deserve all of the thank yous because there's so many people that made everything happen. You know, we have people in the farm because they were killed. And when you talk about recognition, you, we have five martyrs. We have a young Jewish girl, Dan Friedman, that was killed in Florida on the sugar cane workers' strike with Haitian, Jamaican, Puerto Rican, and Mexican farm workers. You know? And then we had Najid Daifala, a young Arab the leader of the, from Yemen that was killed by the uh, deputy sheriff in Kern County. And the third martyr, Juan de la Cruz, who was shot in the heart by a labor contractor on the picket line. And uh, Rufino Contreras, down from the Imperial Valley, who was met with a hail of 80 bullets when he walked in to talk to strike makers into a field in the last one grenade Lopez. So you have all these 19-year-old kid who organized his company to vote for the union after the law was passed. So you have five people that were killed to get the basic human rights of farm workers. You have a lot of people that were beaten up, a lot of people went, that went to jail, you know, people that lost their homes. And even today in the work that we do, you know, we get the recognition, but there's a lot of people that are out there doing the work, you know, knocking on doors and going to meetings and, you know, taking petitions and getting abused. We have one woman who sits on a water board, very, very strong woman, who speaks very broken English, and she has had people yell at her in, in meetings. You don't have the experience, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be here, you're not prepared, you're, you don't know how to speak good English. Yelling at her in an open meeting. And, and she has the strength to continue and do the work that she needs to do there. So, I, it's, I remember during uh, the 60s when they had the books of Juan Castaneda, you know, mm. and, uh, and they got well, Yaki Way of Knowledge, and there was oh, one, wow. line, one line in that book that says, once you take the warrior's path, you can expect to have arrows mm. that are going to be shot at you. Mm -hmm. And this is true, and that's one of the things too, when we say to people, we want you to get involved, but then all of, all of a sudden, all of their family is criticizing them, and they're thinking, did I do the right thing? Mm -hmm. You know, and people thought I was crazy. I had members of my family that didn't even talk to me. And it wasn't until the union became popular, and we were in the news, and all of a sudden everybody came around. Mm -hmm. But uh, so yeah, there's uh, a lot of things, but but it's okay because we know that that's going to happen. You can expect that to happen, but know in your heart that you're doing the right thing. And no matter how much it, uh, you know abusive language is, is aimed at you, and you can see in the film that people where they're uh, talking about me. I have my my children who supporting these kids. You know, like we're not asking them to support them. <laughs> sure. You know? Yeah, so you, you get a lot of a lot of criticism, but that comes with the territory. There was one thank you in particular that I wish I had I had the camera on her, and I feel like that uh, when I heard that thank you to her, I saw the I saw who she really was, mm. 
and we were uh, her foundation's uh, sponsors a Christmas toy giveaway and Christmas dinner for a lot of the undocumented and very poor farm worker families. And there was this, she was dressed in a Santa outfit, and you know the kids line up and they're with their moms and dads, and she's handing out gifts. And there's this little brown skin, dark brown skin girl mm -hmm. who could, you know, she, you could tell she just lacked confidence. She, you know, she wouldn't even lift her head up, and she, you know, she, you could tell she got, she got this gift from Dolores, and her eyes just like, mm -hmm. I, you know, almost, almost makes me <laughs> mm -hmm. tear up. But, mm -hmm. And you know, just it, like right at that moment when mm -hmm. she, she got the gift, her, it just transformed her, mm -hmm. and then, you know, she, Dolores, she said thank you to Dolores, and Dolores gave her this hug. And the first time she, she don't give up the tears, <laughs> but I saw tears coming down her face. And she said, this mm -hmm. is why I do it. Mm -hmm. and, and right at that moment, when I saw that little girl, you know, you can understand. Mm -hmm. Like that thank you, it was real. And the impact was immediate. Mm -hmm. And her empowerment and her confidence, you know, just shifted before my eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing where she came from and her struggle, her family. But, uh, I felt like I saw, I saw who. I saw why she does it and who she is. And that's remained consistent. So I can't let you guys go without asking you to give me a statement or a reflection about today, about now, about what's happening mm -hmm. that you want others to just take a hold of. Well, I, I just say to folks out there, please get involved, get involved in campaigns. We have congressional elections coming up in 2018. Uh, we can build a congressional wall of, of, of resistance, you know, to uh, to the president, to Donald Trump, and to stop some of these policies or change some of the policies that he's bringing down that are going to be hurting so many people. And we have the power to do that. But we've got to get in there. And it's not just, not just about voting. It's about actually getting involved, helping the candidate get elected, you know, getting on our school boards or, or supporting good people on school boards so we can end the racism and the misogyny and the homophobia that we have and the anti-labor sentiments by getting our, our stories into kindergarten. We've got to get our stories into kindergarten of the contributions of people of color to this country, otherwise we're never going to end the racism that we have. We've, we've got to make that a top priority uh, to end the racism in our society because it's a cancer that's destroying us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the message is simple. We need your help. We need you to get, to get involved. Uh, each one of us has to put in whatever time, whatever resources that we can give uh, to be able to, to keep our democracy because we're losing it. Wonderful. Well, I, I heard a great uh, spiritual leader from India say one time that, that human beings find uh, deep meaning through work. And so in that sense, you know, this is a very exciting time to be alive because there's never been more work to do. Mm -hmm. I love it. And we can well, look, look at our website, DoloresWorta.org, you know, we're working on stopping the school of prison pipeline, organizing parents, you know, and uh, doing all this work. And uh, people can get, look at our website and see what we're doing. Who is she talking to now? What is she up to now?